Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark Bastian. I'm pleased to be here at ClosureCon to be able to speak. Um, my topic is defeating the four horsemen of the coding apocalypse. Since this is a closure talk, we need to start with a definition of the apocalypse. Um, that would be the complete final destruction of the world as described in the biblical book of Revelation or an event involving destruction or damage on an awesome or catastrophic scale. And in the Revelation account of the apocalypse, there are four horsemen, pestilence, war, famine, and death. And they are the harbingers of doom. They bring about the end of the world and total destruction. You're probably wondering, what does this have to do with software development? Um, as I look around at the challenges that I face as a software developer and the problems I see all around me in the industry, on the teams I work with, I believe that we have categorical problems. I've come up with four, and appropriately that matches up with our four horsemen. They are unfamiliarity, complexity, opacity, and distance. Any one of these, if we are dealing with them on a regular basis, can be quite frustrating and can hamper our work. If you're dealing with all four of them, you're going to be in an end of the world apocalyptic situation in which you're getting nothing done. So what I wanna to do today is talk about what each of these are, uh, identify or talk about how we can identify them and then provide some strategies for how we can defeat them. So let's jump right in. Our first horseman is unfamiliarity, this idea that we know something or don't know something. That's pretty straightforward. The thing that's most interesting about this particular horseman is that this problem is not a technical problem and does not have a technical solution. It really is an optimization problem. It's all about how do I spend my time? Um, and if I were to borrow some terminology from machine learning, um, I would say this is really a, a balance between how, whether I exploit or explore. I can spend my time using known strategies to exploit the things I already know to get an expected reward. And when I do this, this is easy. It's familiar, it's, it's terminology that we're familiar with. And oftentimes when we say, I want an easy solution, that's what we're saying is we want to be in familiar territory. Um, however, that can lead to stagnation, suboptimal solutions. On the flip side, we can spend time exploring. And when we explore, it's, this is harder. We're out in unknown territory. It's things we're just not sure about. And it's harder. And, and we have this expectation, though, that we're going to have a higher reward. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. But it leads to growth if we do that. So then the question is, where do you invest your time as a software developer, as a, as a technical professional? You can say, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the solutions that I have. I'm just going to stick with that. I'm going to be in the, in the comfort zone with no growth. And, and maybe you're happy with the results you're going to get. But don't expect to get something better. On the other hand, you can say, I'm really unhappy with my current solutions. I'm going to spend all of my time learning new things. And so I'm going to be in this area that I call the impossible zone. Because if all you're doing is learning new things, everything is unfamiliar. And it looks strange. And so you're really not going to get anything done. The boundary between these two is very interesting, though, because it's quite large. And I call this the Goldilocks zone. It's where things are not too hard. They're not too easy. They're just right. Um, what's interesting, though, is it's quite a large, uh, a large parameter there. And so you have to decide with your limited time, where do I spend my time? I could spend my time learning a new framework, a new domain, a new language. You could do, you do all kinds of things. Um, but again, remember, your time is limited. And so you can't do everything. So I'm going to offer two strategies that I think will help to minimize our risk and maximize our reward as we try to balance how to explore. The first one is fairly straightforward. It's learn from others and teach what you know. And I think that the closure community excels at this. I think that as we are, you know, as you're, as you're coming into the community and you want to learn closure, there are people out there that are just happy to help. And I think that's wonderful. And I think on the flip side, if you know closure, a particular technique uh, doesn't need to be closure, but you think it's made your life better, then be willing to help other people to, to bridge that gap to make it easier for them to move from what is unfamiliar to what is familiar to them. The next thing I want to spend a little more time on, and that's this idea that if we really want to strategically invest our time, we should spend our time learning enduring transferable skills. Well, what do I mean by that? So let's look at this. Which of these, if I were to say my domain is music, I want to make music, which of these is a transferable skill or, or idea? I can learn to play the piano, the cello, the acoustic guitar, the electric guitar, or Guitar Hero. Um, I think, you know, I heard some chuckles. I think most of us would agree that all of the, you know, classical or regular musical instruments are something that gives me some transferable, enduring skill. I learn how to play one particular instrument. I learn how to listen by ear to uh, read sheet music and so on. And then when I move to another instrument, 
there are certain aspects of it that certainly are going to be different, but there's a lot that carries with me. And then throughout my life, I have those skills I've learned to make music. Guitar Hero, on the other hand, it's easy to get familiar with it. It's, it's, it's easy. Um, you, you know, plug it in, you start playing, you can master all the songs in a little bit. But once you've done that, that's the end of the, that, that skill you develop. There's nothing else. The skill you develop is button mashing. Um, and so there's nothing transferable about that. What I'm going to suggest as it relates to software development and closure is that one of the most valuable and transferable and enduring skills that we can have is learn to think in terms of data and to learn to model our domains as data. So let's look at an example here. So here is my uh, Horseman of the Apocalypse domain. It's contrived, of course. But um, I've modeled this as uh, JSON. This is also perfectly valid Python code. So let's say you're a Python developer. You don't know Clojure and you want to learn it. You can look at this, and it's self-describing. You can see, OK, I, I, I've modeled my, my, my domain this way. I also have a couple of kinds of functions I can use. I have abstractions over that data, things like map and filter and reduce. And, and they have that in Python as well as in Clojure and Scala and you know, Java, all your major languages. And then when you need to get down to the specifics, you might write some, some functions for manipulating that. So what's cool about that is once you've learned to model your data in this way, then if I show you this new language, Clojure, you're going to look at that and say, you know, this, this is not the same, but by my knowledge, it looks familiar enough to me that I can transfer that and I can pick that up. And then if I write uh, specific functions, they apply to that as well. So now what's, what's even more interesting is not this movement from similar data representations to another, but once you've got that skill of modeling the world in terms of data and then leveraging those abstractions over it, it transfers to other domains. So now the great value there is I can focus on my domain and not on my language implementation. So let's say I want to learn orbital mechanics. I can jump right into modeling the specifics of orbital mechanics and not have to worry about you know, classes and inheritance and all the other things that have to do with developing uh, detailed APIs. Or let's say I want to model board games. Same thing. It's just understanding my domain, modeling it straight up as data, and then applying all those abstractions that I've already learned. Now, you might compare that with uh, OO, for example, and think, all right, I know inheritance, uh, encapsulation, polymorphism. You know, I know annotations. While those may be useful skills, as I move from one implementation to another, it actually doesn't help me at all. There's no knowledge transference. If I'm moving from library A about one domain to library B about another domain, it's all in the implementation. So the fact that I know that the theory doesn't help me at all. So how do we defeat unfamiliarity? Invest your time in learning and teaching. Uh, do it in a uh, strategic manner so that you pick up skills that are enduring and transferable. And remember, data and functional patterns are transferable. Now let's talk about our next horseman, complexity. Uh, the idea of simple versus complex. This is one of the biggest motivations for this talk is when I ask people what their problems are, almost everybody says, oh, everything is so complex and so difficult. And while complexity is certainly a major problem, it is not the only problem. And so uh, let's you know, talk about this along with the others. Um, so complexity is consisting of many different and connected parts. And I put emphasis on and. It's not the number of parts in a system that makes it complex. It's the interplay between them. We always use Legos as, a, as an example of something that's, that's wonderful because a giant box of Legos has tons and tons of components, but because of the simple interface, kinds of new things, you know, it's, it's a simple architecture. And so can I do that in software development? Um, so now I want to bring this idea of uh, unfamiliarity. I want to bring some familiarity to this concept when it comes to software development, because I think we talk about the Lego example, and then we go to software, and then it seems like somewhere very soon we oftentimes admit defeat and say, well, you know, but the real world has like mutable, stateful things in them, so you got to have some, got to have some of that. And you know, so my question is, is it actually reasonable to build functional, data-driven systems that are simple? And so I'm going to say yes, of course. Um, so here's an example I want to work through. Um, this is this, a simple information processing system that I made up for this talk. Um, but it's probably not dissimilar from some of the things you've seen. So it's going to watch a file for a folder, so like a file processing system. And then when it sees those changes, it's going to parse the file. It's going to enqueue the data into the file into a durable queue. It's going to record that I processed the file into a SQL database. I have a watch on the queue. And when it sees changes, it's going to put those results into a database. And then I have some API over all this. And so let's see what this looks like. So uh, here's my file. 
It's just a simple CSV file. Column one is a horseman, and column two is the weapon that it wields. And I can see what files I've processed. I haven't processed any yet. So let's go over and let's touch this file. And then I go back over to my REPL, and I can see messages going by. It's, it's doing what I would expect. It detected the file change and putting all the data in the database. So it's, it's doing all, all, the, all, all the parts are moving. And I can see that it processed the file. And now I have a little API so I can go and see like what weapons do all of my horsemen wield. I can drill down and I can say, you know, what does, uh, uh, you know, what does famine wield, wield scales? What does complexity wield, wield spring? So, you know, everything, everything is exactly as you would expect. All right. Yeah, good one, right? Okay. Well, you know, I can do this. I can do this in Clojure. I can do this in Spring. I can do this any number of ways. It's really about the code that matters. You know, showing that we can do this in a simple manner. So let's go through it. So I'm going to uh, start by saying I use uh, Integrant. I think Integrant is a wonderful library. You don't have to, but um, one cool thing about Integrant to start with is I can configure my entire system, all the stateful pieces as data. It's a single map. And the keys in that map are all the parts of my system. So it's centralized. I don't have like these at component annotations floating around everywhere where I have to jump through the code to figure out what's going on. And the values are the configurations for those parts of my system. All right, now let's look at the individual pieces. So I've got a JDBC connection and a data script connection and a durable queue. These are all just kind of more of the storage oriented parts of my system. I've got a file watcher and we're gonna drill down to these a little more of the things that actually do stuff. Um, and it has data driven configuration. So I'm watching an example folder. And then I've got a couple keys of things that I'm gonna use. I said that file watcher needs to know about the durable queue and the JDBC connection. And then it's got a handler. So again, this is a centralized place where I've configured my entire system. And I can move that around if I need to to make my system different. Now let's look at this handler. This is a, the next interesting piece. All of my logic is just functions. There is no knowledge uh, once I move up to here that this is being driven by Integrant or some other system or anything else. All I know is it's a function and everything I need is passed through as arguments. Now this is not a pure function. I've got, I mean, I'm, I'm manipulating my data, my data in my database in here. So, and that's okay because that's, that's what I'm expecting. The main point though is this is completely standalone. It's encapsulated. I can move it, I can develop it, debug it, test it independently and reuse it in other locations. Same thing with my scheduling job. So my scheduling job, again, I'm configuring it as data. Um, it requires some other parts of the system. And then it's got a job that it triggers every once in a while. And again, it's just a function. All the arguments are coming through. Everything that it uses comes through as arguments. All right, and then my web server. We'll spend a little more time on this one. This, little, this one is a little more interesting. All right, again, configured as data, a couple parts of my system that I need. Now I've got a handler. So recall web handlers are nothing more than a function that takes a request and returns a response. So this handler knows nothing about integrant or my system or anything else. This is a standalone function. And it defers most of its work to this router. And I'm using Reatit, I think it's a great library. And this router, again, knows nothing about the handler. It's a standalone thing that I can debug. And then it's composed as data, which is pretty cool because it's just vectors that say these are my routes and these are the individual handlers I call. But I can go look at one of my individual handlers and see, again, it's just a function that takes arguments Everything goes in through there. And then I'm calling out now to my business logic, my APIs. And my APIs at this point, these are actually pure functions. Everything that goes in is a value and everything that comes out is a value. But again, everything as it moves down is not aware of its external context. So I can develop it independently. I can move it around. I can do, do anything I want with it. Treat it like a Lego brick. Now, for those of you that know Integrant, you may be wondering, and this is the secret sauce that makes all this possible, how does a database connection end up in a web request? So I will explain that. That's a very important part of this presentation. So I've got a couple areas where I'm doing this. So let's go back to, and look at our Integrant initializer. So it, in my config, requires both of those things, SQL con and con, as my two parts of my system. And when that web server key is initialized, I call this multi-method from uh, Integrant. And it passes in that configuration, which has a handler, but it also aliases that entire configuration as this M, this map M. And so then when I launch my immutant server, rather than passing in the bare handler, I'm gonna pass in this wrapped component middleware, 
which is right here. And it takes both my handler and my component. And it returns a new handler. Again, it's just a, it takes a request, returns a response. So there's my request. It calls the original handler in which I have taken my request and I've poured it into my component. So in one line, using just functions and data only, no, no special libraries, no frameworks, no annotations, I'm able to basically achieve simple data-driven functional dependency injection with no, you know, I hate to use the word dependency injection. It sounds like I'm doing so much stuff. All I'm doing is into. Um, it's that easy. All right, so let's see what this buys me. So if I go over to my namespace, um, I have all of the, uh, let's see. <clears throat> so here's my configuration map right here. The important thing that I want to show is I've got this durable comment block down at the bottom. And if you're not doing this, I, I highly recommend doing it. But at the bottom of your namespace as you're working through and developing and have a comment block where you just put the various forms you're working with. And then you can go in later on and, and see what you were doing or what somebody else was doing. That somebody else could be you in six months. Um, and where it's interesting is right down here, I have my individual tests. And they're not really you know, unit tests. They're just exercising the code. And so I can do things like I can say, all right, let's look at this router all by itself, exclusive of the rest of my project. You can see stuff flying by there. That just means that it matched the route. The weapon route does not exist, so it didn't match it. I can test my global handler, again, independent of my system, independent of anything else. Um, some of these handlers, though, the weapons handler, it required that database connection. So how do I mock that up? Well, in my let form, I just create a database's value, and then I associate in, and then I can evaluate it. So it's pretty cool. And then I can do the same thing with query parameters. But I can exercise all these different parts of my code. Where some things get kind of interesting is, uh, for example, here, I want to understand, let me make it a little bigger, I want to understand how some of these different middlewares work. So if I call one of my individual handlers, I see that complexity wields spring. How did I get that out of that complexity name equals complexity query param? So I can comment that out, and I can see that you know, now it yields the entire thing. So that helps me to basically give me insight and intuition into what some of these different pieces of my system, some of these middlewares do. Oftentimes, if you're dealing, developing a web app, for example, there may be a lot of middlewares. It's like, what did each of these do? Mock it out, line them up, comment them out, and you can experiment and figure out exactly what's going on. If I go down a little further, I can test my domain logic. So this is just straight out of my weapons uh, namespace, knows nothing about the web or anything else. Or I can go all the way to the other end of the system and test against the entire system using CLJ HTTP. So it buys me a lot when I, when I have this pattern. I can uh, basically take everything apart, develop it all independently, put it back together the way I want. If I look at this graphically, it would look something like this. This is just the web server aspect of the architecture, not uh, those, the other pieces. They would have a similar diagram. What's awesome about this is on the left, we have um, a data-driven way to combine everything I need as an argument. And so here we're using integrant. It does not need to be an integrant. It can be anything. And then on the right, everything is a function. This is super awesome. Every circle there has one arrow going into it, and that's the arguments that it needs so I can reason about it and think about it. If anything goes wrong, I can tap those, uh, that data in, I can print it, I can do whatever, and I can pull that thing out into a REPL, debug it independently. If there's something going right that I like, I can pop it off and move it to some other application or API. All right, so our functional data-driven system is reasonable, absolutely. And I think once you get into this mindset of, of, of it becomes familiar, you kind of go crazy when you do anything else. Um, so how do we defeat complexity? With functional data-driven systems, um, it can be unfamiliar, but once it becomes familiar, I think it's, uh, a very powerful pattern. I've got a project called Partspin. Please go check it out. Uh, Partspin does a couple things. One, and it says right on it, it is, uh, um, you know, it, it provides philosophy and ideas just on how to structure your programs so that they are functional and data-driven. It also provides implementations for init key for a lot of uh, integrant uh, popular libraries with integrant, as well as anywhere where there's a middleware that could be used to, to, to do that uh, dependency injection, it does that. And, and it also is very clear that if you like the philosophy but don't like the code, that's fine. Vendor, whatever you want. All right, so now let's talk about our next horseman, visibility. Transparency versus opaque. Can I see things? So I have a question. Raise your hand if what is behind this black box is simple. All right, raise your hand if it's complex. Raise your hand if you don't know. 
Well, I, okay, that seems to be pretty universal. All right, I'm going to say that this is simple. All right, we're going to do it again. All right, raise your hand. It, it, the contents of the box change. All right, raise your hand if you think it's simple. All right, we got one. All right, complex. All right, most of you probably think, all right, it's a flip, so you're, it's a trickier. Right, or what if you don't know? All right. So, all right, I'm going to say that's complex. The important point here is that, is that opacity is not complexity. Um, and these are conflated a lot. I get emails all the time from vendors saying, you're going to the cloud, everything is so complex, we want to sell you this thing that lets you see into your system. It may be that that thing is very valuable, it may give me great insights, but that thing doesn't make my system simple. If I have a problem with complexity, the solution is simplicity. If I have a problem with opacity, the solution is transparency. Recognize your horsemen. Um, so how do we solve opacity? In the real world, we solve opacity and you know, the physical world, the world of physics, by making things more visible. That's one way, you know, shine a light on something to brighten it up. Or we use tools to see the object. Here's me and my family watching the eclipse a couple years ago. We used tools to do that so we wouldn't go blind. All right, so how do you make objects? We're talking about code more visible. Well, that has a, that has a connotation. We're talking about object. We're talking about OO. It's important to realize that objects are fundamentally opaque. If I have an object, class, whatever, and I print that out, it's dependent upon the language. You know, if it's in Java, you're gonna get like the class name and a hash code or something. It is not, there's nothing about that that I can look at to tell me what's going on. It all depends on who is implementing two-string, if they're implementing two-string, you know, do they include all the fields, do they include the class name, do they make it look like JSON, you know, who knows? It's entirely up to them. On the flip side, data literals are fundamentally transparent. They're self-describing, I look at them, it's like, yep, got it. Now let's look at the other half of it, tools, using tools to see things. There are a lot of great tools out there. Visual VM is something that gives me insight into memory and CPU usage. Uh, logging consoles are great tools for allowing me to have a consolidated way to reach out there and see what people are printing out to their terminals. And the logs are fundamentally transparent to the extent that you have the data you need logged. Um, Interactive debuggers. This one's an interesting one. The more I think about it, the more I realize interactive debuggers exist almost solely for the purpose of giving visibility into problems. Um, if you think about it, if you know that a null pointer exception is being thrown somewhere, you put a breakpoint on that line, you run to it, you are past the problems of complexity and anything else. It may be that you're trying to understand maybe some interactions, but at this point, you just can't see what's going on. That's why you have that debugger. So you go down to there and you go to your little variable view and expand your tree, and it's a great tool, but, but that's, that's really what it's for. These all have limitations, though. All three of these are on the outside of the application looking in. You're trying to attach yourself to a process that's like being in a, you know, a museum and you can only look through the windows. Wouldn't it be better if you could go inside and wander around? Uh, the other thing is you may not be able to use the tool. If you've got a, a Java process that hasn't been run in debug mode and it's remote, you might not be able to attach a remote debugger to it. Um, and you only get what the tool provides. You know, a lot of these tools have special purposes, and they may be great for that purpose, but you know, they're limited in their scope. So I'm gonna propose that the ultimate tool is the REPL, of course. Um, why is the REPL so awesome? Well, one, you're dealing with data. Um, that, that ability to see what's going on, it's perfectly transparent. On the other side, we're talking about the tool itself. One thing that's really neat about the REPL is you are in the program. You can navigate to wherever you need to be, whatever namespace you need to be in your application and, and, and do anything. Um, and I also put in here, also consider the REPL. The REPL and the REPL go hand in hand. It's another way to uh, drill down into your, into your domain and see what's going on. But both of these, again, are, are things that allow you to get inside of the program and navigate around um, wonderfully. All right, so how do we defeat opacity with data in the REPL? It's that simple. All right, our final uh, horseman is distance, the idea of near at hand versus far away. So, we know that distance, and we know this from elementary school, distance is not something, it's not just linear, but it's also in time, and there's this relation here, distance equals rate times time, we know that. And so you might ask, how far is it from Boise to Salt Lake City? And I might say, it's 340 miles, or I might say it's five hours by car. And those are both acceptable answers. Um, one is a linear distance, the other one is a temporal distance, but either one gives you an idea for how far away it is, and either way, it's pretty far if you, you, know, you need to get there immediately. <clears throat> so let's talk about distance when it comes to software development. So we have this spectrum. On one end is the near at hand end, and kind of the ideal world is you are sitting in front of your computer, you've got some form you're uh, trying to understand in front of you, you've got like a let binding, and everything is contained in one form. And so there's no context switching, it's all right there in your head. Well, that's 
pretty small in scope. At some point, you're going to have to move out and have a few more functions. And they're all on your screen. So you're moving your eyes around a little bit. There's a little bit of context switching going on, just a little. Maybe one or two balls you have to juggle in your head. And so the, the distance is becoming greater and greater. You know, as, you, as you extend that to any of our larger systems, you're going to have functions that exist in the namespace off the screen or in a different file or a different library. The further you go, the problem is with that distance, what that does is that causes more and more context switches in your head as you have to jump around to figure out what's going on. Ultimately, it goes off of your computer to, I'm going to say here, your building. You've got some problem and you need to figure out, okay, what did, what did so-and-so do? Or something is going on, I need to go talk to my systems engineering team or, or somebody else. So you have to get up out of your seat and all of a sudden you're walking around and this, this now is an enormous context switch in terms of space and time. You're walking down the hall to ask somebody what was going on. Somebody interrupts you, you know, how was your weekend? Did you like the latest movie? And then you've been derailed. And so distance becomes larger and larger. <clears throat> on the far end of the spectrum, we have the cloud. And the cloud is awesome. It provides us so many things, you know, the ability to not have to worry about a lot of things. I just develop my code, deploy it out to the cloud. All those aspects are great. However, the cloud is fundamentally far away in terms of both space and time. So let's, let's look at an example of this. So here is a, uh, a basic platform with a service development environment I've just mocked up. You could have any type of architecture you want or design. And so here you are coding, 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 and then you run, 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 and you like your solution. And so you commit that and then you push it out to Heroku. Let's say you're using Heroku. And that takes about a minute and a half. Um, the times I'm showing are based on the uh, scientific uh, approach of taking one sample uh, and timing it from my uh, desktop, um, but it doesn't really matter. And then the other thing is maybe I deploy to uh, EBS and uh, a bean, elastic beanstalk, and maybe that takes six and a half minutes. It does take me quite a bit longer. It has to spin everything up. Um, the problem here, though, it doesn't really matter whether it's a minute and a half or six and a half minutes. Either way, the deployment time dominates my workflow. If you're used to REPL-driven development, everything is instantaneous and at hand. You are in a mode of flow, and then it's like, all right, I have to stop and push. And you do that, and then, you know, a minute, five minutes, ten minutes, it doesn't matter. You have to wait around, see what happened. If something went wrong, then you make another change, and, you know, you have to wait that, that cycle again. So it kills you. So I'm going to propose that we... Uh, have a simple instantaneous development workflow. And the way we do this is we have our exactly the same thing we had before, deploy to one of these two or anything else. But then what we do is try to have a REPL server running everywhere we are and everything we're doing. So can I have the ability, if let's say I'm working on Beanstalk, to jack into a Beanstalk instance and develop against that? And this is my fast loop. And then my slow loop is when I'm happy with what I do, I do a deploy. And so this is, you know, we talk about continuous integration being wonderful, continuous, but this is instantaneous integration. And then you just deploy when you need to. So you know, you're working away, you make your changes, uh, everything is great, and then you, uh, you do your deploy. It's gonna take a minute and a half. It's gonna kick you off of your uh, REPL session, but it only takes about a second to reconnect, so that's no big deal. So let's do a demo. All right. So I've got this really cool 1998 application over here. And so I just wanted to do a little reality check that I'm connected. So I'm connected to my, uh, my EC2 instance out there in the cloud. And this is not running on my local machine. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here. And I want to just make a few changes. I'm not super good at live coding, especially ergonomically here. So I have everything done already. I'm just going to change my comments around. And we want to make it a little more, a little cooler, a little more closure looking. So I just evaluated my form in my REPL. But this was not on this machine. This was out there on that machine. So now I can just go ahead and uh, refresh my browser. And you know, instantaneous feedback. I didn't have to wait six and a half minutes to see what happened. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, if you have your camera. A smartphone, you can aim it at that QR code and go to this awesome website if you would like. Um, something else that's kind of cool about this is as I was preparing this, uh, this talk, I went through a lot of cycles of code and things I had to, to cull eventually 
So I have put a couple of the things that got dropped I put here. Um, these are, again, super cool uh, 1990s style games. But uh, so you can go here, you know, why are you here to give a closure talk? How do you feel about it when you say that? Awesome. So anyways, um, I also have, I got a couple minutes I could show this. I also have this uh, Defeat the Four Horsemen application, which um, you're welcome to try out. Um, I banged this out in like one uh, on a Saturday, and then I realized I didn't have time to go over all of it. The, the, the principle here, though, was uh, it's the simplicity thing. I had this maze code I'd written years ago, and I thought, you know, could I, if I wanted to make a dungeon game, could I repurpose my maze code and put some stuff in there and, and uh, with like no modification, I was able to do it. So it's easy to put things together when they're data driven, right? Um, the way this works, you got your little happy face guy here, and you just kind of click around in one direction you want, and then you go down and like you capture the. Uh, you got a red sword. If you get the right colored weapon, you can go kill the horseman of the right of that particular color. And if you don't, then it will kill you. So you're welcome to try it out. It's uh, you know, it's not the latest AAA game. Uh, all right, well, when would you do this? Early stage development, you're not gonna do, most of the time you probably do wanna be on your desktop. This isn't something you're gonna do like all the time, but on, in early stage development, it's super frustrating when you're learning a new API and you try something and it doesn't work and you're just kind of bouncing against that. If you have to wait like six and a half minutes every time you try that, that's terrible. So if you've got a simple one instance machine running, go develop against that until you figure it out. If you wanna do a rapid development iteration with users, like people at a conference that are watching what you're doing, it's a great opportunity. Um, if you want to run diagnostics, when you have environmental differences, if something works locally and it doesn't work remotely, there's nothing you can do locally to figure out what's going on. You really need to be on that machine and know what's going on there. All right, so would you do this in production? I know there are people out there freaking out like, oh my goodness, a REPL on everything. If your production system is on fire, everything is going wrong, um, and you're thinking, well, can I restart it to solve the problem? Well, you're not solving the problem, you're kicking the symptoms down the road. Um, you know, is that going to uh, prevent you from diagnosing the root cause? If a restart eliminates the symptoms, how do you fix it? If a restart's what you need to do to enter debug mode, you're kind of screwed. Um, is the data you need being logged? So, you know, why not do this? If the, if the REPL is such a powerful tool that we use all the time on our desktop, why not do everything we can to put a REPL everywhere? How do we defeat the distance? Put everything, put a REPL on everything. Make it all REPL enabled. I've got a project that's not quite as mature as the uh, Partspin project called the CLJ Cloud Playground. It's my attempt to, with various architectures and cloud providers, to document just very simple step-by-step -step or provide links for how to uh, connect to a cloud instance because it's not always super easy. Um, I've got really good directions for how to do it with Heroku or with Beanstalk. Um, if anyone has uh, solutions or wants to work with me for other providers, let me know. I'd be happy to document that. But the whole idea is you know, how do we make it available to us when we need it or want it. So in conclusion, uh, choose the right horse, know your problem, and use the right solution. Make sure you spend time exploring to defeat unfamiliarity. Uh, make sure you make your complex things simple, your opaque things transparent, and make things that are far at hand. If you're ever in doubt, which horse am I facing, what do I do, or how do I stop the horse from killing me in the future, remember, data-driven functional solutions will facilitate defeating any horseman. All right, those are some links. Um, and I think we have time for maybe one or two questions if anybody has any.